Welcome to Philosophy Insights. Today's topic is the failure of university education. Recently, Professor Stephen Blackwood gave an interview on this topic. He's the founder of Ralston College, in which Jordan Peterson is involved with as well. Interestingly, Blackwood claims that many would be better off not going to college at all. Here is Blackwood. And then you've got the whole student loan crisis, you know, the, the way the federal, the federal government is radically distorting these things and, lead, and you know, not only leading to inflation and things like that, but, but essentially there's no normal market corrective mm -hmm. on a poor product because the federal governments would just give anyone anything they want just to study at university. It's a disaster. It's actually have way too many people going to get degrees that are often not worth the, the paper they're printed on or not finished or whatever. You should look at the completion rates. It's unbelievable nationally. And then, you know, you've got... Wait, how, how bad are you? I, do, I can't give you it. I don't want to do it. Misspeak. Yeah. But there are many, there are many places in which dropout rates are 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 well over fifty. Per, I, I I think I'm not not misspeaking to say well over fifty percent or incompletion rates. Right. And so that's to say people not finishing the degree they started. Right. And so but they're still have to, they're still have a loan for the money that they spent on the time that they don't get degrees. It's, it's Ironically, with some of the stuff they're learning, it's probably not the worst thing. Well, that you know, not finishing. But uh, uh, honestly, I think stands. many many people would be far better off not going to university at all. And I think it's an important point for me to make because here I'm found, you know, part of a team founding a new college. Right. Might, might make it seem like I think college is the answer. Answer. I think by and large most, if not most, very, very many people can and should and will lead uh, higher and better and more beautiful lives by not going to college. And we need to remember that, right? We don't want to become a place that somehow thinks we're all just minds or that everyone has a mind that is good at thinking about this. We have people who are in the, in the true diversity of the human race. We need people who are doing many different kinds of things and most of them, by the way, don't involve going to college. Given the current crisis of colleges, many try to rebuild the universities from within. Blackwood is skeptical, and here's why. You can analyze this from any number of different ways. There's the, the woke and the ideology and the politicization of education. It's a huge problem. Um, and whether it, whether it is inevitable, I think actually, yes, it is. I think there is, there is no... There is no continuity without, without sort of birth and rebirth. Mm -hmm. And you can look at any industry, anytime, anywhere. And I think in the higher, higher education in the United States, I mean, if you want to, want to really get into it, these problems are not new. I mean, you can go back to, you know, it's kind of an ur text for many, you know, small c conservatives is William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale. Mm -hmm. It's written in 1950 or 51 or 52. It's or very early 50s. That's 70 years ago. You can look at the most famous book in this is regard as Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind, written in 1985. I mean, that's a long time ago. And you say, well, what have we done in this time? And I think, broadly speaking, people thought, well, we can kind of reform from within. And I think we should never give up on a great institution. It would be nihilism to give up on something beautiful that has been meaningful and could still be meaningful, but at the same time, I think we have to admit that that strategy has been an abysmal failure. Because during the time in which we've been suppo supposedly trying to do things internally, I would say the situation with the universities has got far worse in that time than better. And so the point is, is finally to say that, you know, I think the current situation is like the one I gave with the example of hunger. Because, you know, let me just say, ask you whether you would agree with this. Because you speak to a lot of people, you have a good sense of you know the pulse of of of, of a kind of a whole generation of, of people of, of and and multiple generations. I would put it to you that no that the average fifteen to twenty five year old when they're or thirty year old whatever you want to say when they're trying to make sense of life when they're like oh gosh you know dealing with uh, you know, cancer or de death or suffering or depression or my addiction or whatever. You know, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of my life in the deepest way. Like the thing that matters the most to all of us is like, can we live a life that we regard as worth living, right? There is no more important question for human beings than that. I would put it to you that the first, that at the top of the list of the places that they would look is not the university. No, and, <laughs> I mean. And, yeah, what, yeah, that, and I what that means is that the place that should be one of the most mm -hmm. obvious places you turn, the repository of all human learning and, and the humanities, which are nothing but the record of what other human beings have thought about their lives in the past, which is one of the key sources to try and understand our lives. The point I'm making is that the industry, broadly speaking, higher education has taken such a wrong turn that the thing it should be most known for, people don't even turn to it for. It'd be like the last place you turned to fill up your car was a gas station because it, it no longer it, had any gas. It almost seems like it's the complete reverse, actually. Yes. It's the 180. It's not that it's just slightly missing or they veered off slightly. They actually give you none of those tools. They teach you a whole other set of things that have very little to do with In the, many places, the lessons of the sadly, I think that is true. Yeah.
You may end up worse off intellectually, spiritually, morally, uh, by having your mind corrupted by a certain kind of very downward-looking, cynical nihilism that really, and I don't think I can say this strongly enough because I'm not, a, I'm not a, a political or instrumental thinker, I think we know that there are ideas that are really toxic for your soul and they lead to bad places psychologically, relationally, intellectually, and that's a bad place to be. All of this raises the question what the value of humanity education is and how it can be useful and if there's a way back to a proper humanity education. So there's a real sense in which Greece and the language of Greek has always been kind of like a source, like a, like a well that perennially f enables us, if we attend to it, just as many other things, history of religion and other, I'm not saying it's all about Greece all the time, mm -hmm. but it's a core aspect of uh, Western culture since uh, its earliest days in the fifth century BC. I did see the movie 300, and I'm pretty sure that's why they were always taking out Athens, right? Well, they were pretty pissed at these people who had ideas and were doing good things and spreading freedom. I mean, I'm, I'm half kidding, actually, no, but not fully. No, I don't. I think I think if 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 the battle if the, if the war against the battle against the Persians had gone differently, the uh, the various fish, series of famous battles that the Greeks had no business winning, right? It's like you know these massive forces of the empire yeah. descending on this you know little little group of of, of kind of this band of citizens who just said give me freedom or give me death. If that, if they had not won those battles, well, there would have been, I think we can say confidently there would have been no Western culture. The ideas and right. ideas of Greece would not have made it out into a, a wider, a wider sphere that, that wouldn't have been the, you might say the, the seeds that lay, laid the, 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 the groundwork for the whole Roman Empire. Uh, they were the seeds that transformed the, uh, the Christian revelation. They were the seeds in some respects. They were the ideas through which Frankly, all of the, the, the religions of the book, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, at certain points in history have all been reading their books, their holy books, the, their Bibles, through the lens of Greek philosophy and the categories of thought we were just talking about. So the point I'm making is that you cannot really overstate how influential that moment is because it's, it is kind of the, in a, in a significant way, it is, if not the, one of the sources from which the whole, you might say, trunk and tree of what we now call Western culture grows. So you bring these students there, and you were telling me the other night a little bit about the rigorous process to just get in the program in the first place. But so they go there, they learn about the humanities, they, they get this, the, the keys to this great knowledge. Um, are most of them thinking about what they're going to do after? Because one of the mess questions I get on this show all the time when we do Q&As, I get from parents who are like, first off, they're very leery of sending their kids to college in the first mm -hmm. place. Then the second question is, where do I send them? And the third thing is, is anything that they're going to learn there going to equip them to be out in the real world? If you're teaching kids all about the humanities, it's wonderful in terms of a, a full life. But are they thinking about what they want to do after, or is it almost not that important yet in some regard? Well, I think... Because you're going just purely yeah, and for I knowledge, think this, it sounds. Yeah, I think this raises a really interesting question, Dave, because I think we have to think really honestly about what is useful, frankly. And I would begin, my starting position would be, what matters the most to a human being has got to be, at some level, what they regard as most important, and, and th that's, that's what enables them to have that, perhaps, most useful. And I, I really would put it as a fundamental contention that, that there is nothing that matters more to human beings. We're self-conscious creatures. We don't just live as automata. Like, we think about ourselves. We value things. We, we feel bad when we do things that we think we shouldn't have done. We have hopes and dreams. We, we love. We, we love beauty. We, 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 we g gather in community. What I would say is there is nothing more important than giving a human being the tools for them to regard their own life as mu meaningful. And that doesn't come down to simply material things. I mean, you can have all the material wealth and success in the world and be, 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 feel like you are, you are poor inside, that you, 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 you can not have the relationships. That, I mean, no one gets to the deathbed saying, oh gosh, I wish I just made a little more money. Mm -hmm. I mean, they get to the deathbed saying, you know, they're still thinking about things like, why did I never reconcile with my brother? And, and how could I have done so? And, and so I really want to explode this idea that, that the humanities are somehow, and I'm not saying you're suggesting yeah. this, but as if there's somehow this, this recherche thing, oh, you know, we imagine an English accent or something like, you know, we're at a cocktail party talking about something that no one gives a damn about. Yeah. No, I'm talking about the fundamental questions, truth, justice, love, beauty, forgiveness. How do these things work? What are they? And that's the bedrock. And so I'd say that, but then it also say something more practical towards your question, which is, it's easy to 
think that the best way to do something practical is practical. And in fact, this is a really interesting thing about the humanities. If you subordinate them to a practical instrumental outcome, like I said, I'm going to read Shakespeare because it helped me to teach marketing. Right. Or I'm going to help me to learn how to sell razors or something. Right. It's going to fall through your, 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 your hands like, like, like sand. Like it's, yeah. You're not going to have anything left because you're never going to get anything out of damn Shakespeare if you read them that way. Whereas if you really attend to this amazing you know, uh, uh, understanding of the human condition, you really get into that. Well, you know, that may make you quite powerful when you start thinking about what motivates people, how do we speak to people, and I'm not saying it's going to help you sell a million razors, but it very well may. And so the point I'm making is that if you don't subordinate it practically, it becomes unbelievably powerful. I mean, let, let's, let's, let's just be honest about the fact that, that the kind of education I'm talking about is in fact the education that has basically defined, you know, statesmen, politicians, uh, uh, the the, uh, the movers and shakers and doers uh, in many respects of, of, our whole, of our whole history. So this is, it's actually a very recent idea and I think it's, it's, pro it's profoundly mistaken to think that the way in which you can do something important, even in the real world, mm -hmm. is you've got to start, start by understanding that world fundamentally. Thank you for watching this video and if you like the content, subscribe to Philosophy Insights.